And here we go. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. My name is George Ruby. I'm a University of Kentucky session organizer along with uh, Ian O'Byrne and Greg Berry. And uh, you'll be hearing from them shortly. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, the uh, title of all, our, our alternative session is Clip Text, Fractionated Conceptions of Text and Textuality. Should be an exciting session. We have a great lineup of scholars to address the topic, that being definitions of instructional text and theme, that being the trade-off between scope and precision necessary when operationalizing definitions for research, practice, or policy. Let me note first, this is a Petra Kucha session. That means each presenter gets 20 slides, pre-timed to 20 seconds each for a total of six minutes and 40 seconds. It's a very tight timeline, but it's meant to force focus by restricting meta-discourse and tangential digression. <laughs> ah, a trade-off between scope and precision. There you go, okay. We've got nine scholars presenting this afternoon. We'll uh, group them into triads, three presentations in a row, and then have about three minutes between each triad for irrepressible audience response. But only three minutes, because we want to keep most of the response for the end. Uh, the order of the presentation will be different from the order listed in the program. We're going to begin uh, with David Pearson, followed by Frida Hebert, followed by Anne McGill Franzen. Then we'll have some audience response. Then, uh, I think, uh, oh, Frank, Se uh, Frank Severini, then either Ian O'Barn and Greg McBerry, but I'm not sure which order, and then Margaret Haygood, uh, and then uh, Ronnie Joe Draper, and then finally Kelly Chandler Olcott. Is this a great lineup or what? Right. And the session's being video recorded so you'll be able to get it on YouTube. We've attempted a range of orientations in the session, theoretical frames, cognitive, sociocultural, techno-modernist, developmental, a range of student populations, early reading skills people, children's literature people, content area people, adolescent literacies people, new literacies people. We've got a balance of men and women and a selection across career stages. On the other hand, we are admittedly missing any racial and linguistic diversity, uh, and I apologize for that. The uh, scholars of color we invited could not be at LRA this year. When we got to the end of our wish list, it was about three hours before deadline. Lesson learned, don't start writing your proposal two days before the deadline, okay? Uh, again, the, uh, uh, the topic, instructional text, uh, the, the theme is trade-offs. So every presenter here today will address four key questions. One, what is your definition of instructional text? Two, what does the definition emphasize or accomplish in practice or research? Three, what does the definition leave out that may also be of importance? And four, how do you deal with what gets neglected? Or does it matter? Before we hear the responses to those questions, let me outline the, uh, the issues we had in mind when uh, uh, Ian and Greg and I put this together. Every definition of text implies a definition of literacy, and vice versa. Every theory of reading development implies a model of appropriate reading instruction with potential implications for identifying developmentally and instructionally appropriate text but there are unavoidable trade-offs in making such choices. Time, attention, resources devoted to certain aspects of literacy instruction are not available to devote to other aspects usually, opportunity costs in literacy education. If we choose to emphasize teaching young children uh, the rudiments of the graphic code, for instance, we might argue for decodable text, but in doing so, we at least implicitly de-emphasize the teaching of syntactic and semantic patterns and other elements of text-related language comprehension. If we construct texts that emphasize orthographic regularities, we fail to deal with the ubiquitous irregularities to be found in the text. If we place outlines and glossaries at the front of textbook chapters to facilitate students' <laughs> reading comprehension, we may fail to adequately develop their autonomous vocabulary inference and text structure modeling skills. <laughs> Additionally, if you use a text to try to emphasize and foster the development of particular reading skills, especially constrained reading skills, and impose them as required texts in the classroom, how do you address the needs of teachers who face a more diverse range of student developmental trajectories and instructional requirements? Some students may no longer need the exaggerated text assigned to their grade, while others are developmentally unable yet to benefit from it. Imposed text include options. Other issues include text leveling as an aspect of instructional textuality. Recently, there's been some argument by Shanahan and others for using frustration level text to advance reading ability. But how to make that work likely depends on the reading and linguistic abilities of the student relative to the assumed mean. Uh, as well as the level of frustration implied. Then there's the issue of instructional versus authentic texts. Historically, this debate has generated more heat than light. Authenticity, as argued by scholars, seems a very different thing than authenticity as experienced by students. That is, chapters that students actually recognize as independent inclusion in a particular discourse community to which they wish to belong. It's my file. Right. Otherwise, the text, real world or not, is as peculiar 
favorite yet uninteresting as any other text teachers make me read. Uh, Jerry Harsty has said that curriculum is a metaphor for the kind of people we wish to become. Where do we accomplish the necessary student tie-in between text and self for long-range literacy development on behalf of a literate identity and a literate society? And remember, theories are tools, but they operate at different scales of analysis. Yet the relation of form and function in structured text for instructional purposes requires more than alignment with the typically veiled causative assumptions embedded in our theoretical frames. Oh good, I got a chance to breathe. Speaking of which, our research journals and handbooks are kind of instructional texts, written and laid out in a way that notoriously blazes the eyes of the uninitiated, but that allows the condescending to negotiate the substance in an expeditious and effective way. Doctoral programs offer copious opportunities to develop the reading and writing skills necessary to make use of these kinds of texts. Our professional journals do much the same, reiterating for enrichment purposes the idioms, memes, and touchstones du jour favored by the professoriate, so that the teachers may become that become common parlance for teachers. Finally, and I'll end on this, uh, thankfully, conference sessions such as this are a kind of instructional text, structured in a peculiar way for value purposes. One of our proposal reviewers asked, are you sure a pet kucha approach is the best way to present this kind of information? And the truth is, I don't know. But we think the answer is yes. And we'll find out. Remember, the idea here is to enjoy abbreviated position statements from each of these scholars. It is up to you the audience to make the comparisons and contrasts between positions to act in essence as a collective discussant. Please do so and enjoy the show. And again, let me thank you. Let me thank the presenters in advance. Uh, uh, and uh, let me thank my computer for still running. And I think we're going to be OK here, folks. So at this point, I get to say thank you. <laughs>